Hey nerds, Farmer Jesse here. Welcome to Growers Daily, your daily dose of ecological farming insight. It is Monday, April 7th, 2025, and today we're going to discuss microplastics messing with photosynthesis, agrochemicals and alcohol, and why we can't just turn uh, plastic that we waste into bricks. It's a plastic kind of day, I guess. So let's do it. All right, everyone. Uh, happy Monday. I hope you all had a nice and less wet than we did weekend. The flooding in my region is just stunning. Uh, the rain that I started talking about, what was that, like Wednesday? It basically did not stop until early this morning. And if you're following this on YouTube, you can see how heavy the rainfall was still coming on like Saturday night after several days of rain already. Uh, my farm is absolutely soaked. I may have lost like a bed or two of, of spinach, which is not great, but comparatively fine. Frankfurt, which is about uh, 15 minutes north of here, it's like the state capital, has been severely hit, however, leaving uh, large swaths of Kentucky's capital along with other parts of the region underwater. Our friends at a place called Locals, where we sell a lot of produce, they support a lot of local farmers uh, throughout the season, they're very near to taking on water, at least they were last night. I'm not sure what that looks like this morning as I record this, uh, but certainly thinking of them and all the people and small businesses in that town, today marks episode like 125, and I have to say that I have now talked about catastrophic and in this case, his absolutely historic flooding in Kentucky three times in six months which doesn't feel like an altogether sustainable pace. But sending our love to those hammered by this wild, uh, wet series of storms, the floodwaters are supposed to finally peak, like, well, were last night. So uh, hopefully that will recede quickly. What a week. Anyway, changing gears for today, I want to talk about plastics, specifically about microplastics and, and photosynthesis. So a few of you sent me this article from The Guardian titled Microplastics Hinder Plant Photosynthesis Study Finds Threatening Millions with Starvation. Uh, researchers say problem could increase number of people at risk of starvation by 400 million in the next two decades. Obviously, uh, that is an eye-popping headline, one that my journalistic brain was admittedly a little skeptical about, but certainly one worth exploring. To back up, on March 10th, a study was published in the Journal of Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences that examined the impact of microplastics on plants from more than 3,000 observations taken from 157 studies and found some pretty striking effects and or potential effects of microplastics on the environment, but specifically on food production and photosynthesis. Basically, as plastic breaks down, it doesn't get turned into its constituent parts, really. It slowly kind of gets shredded into smaller and smaller pieces, uh, like little plastic particles, all while slowly leaching some of those chemicals until the point that it becomes uh, micro or even nanoplastics, so small it's even found embedded in microbes. But in its micro form, microplastics have been found in human bodies, in wombs, in breast milk, embedded in our brains and livers. I found this slide that you're looking at if you're watching on YouTube of it in, in toothpaste, so that's cool. Uh, basically, microplastics have been found in almost every part of the human body. It gets there through the air we breathe, through the water we drink, through the food we eat, etc. And it is, of course, in our plants. Like the human body, it is literally inside of them. What it's doing there, we are just kind of starting to understand. One thing that's been observed in these uh, is that these microplastics, according to research out of China, uh, quote, obstruct nutrient and water channels within plants, impacting nutrient and water absorption, end quote. That research also describes how microplastics can gravely affect the soil health as well as, as plant health. Super uplifting read. Anyway, so the research that Guardian headline comes from looked at this uh, on a more global scale and basically asked, what will the presence of these microplastics do to the global food supply? Like, if you have these microplastics that are slowing down photosynthetic rate and soil health and all these things, what does that do to our food? And although more research is definitely needed always, uh, the initial indications are not great. We're talking about a potential loss of 12% or more globally in terms of photosynthetic rate itself leading to 14% loss or so on yield on things like corn and rice, presumably among other crops. Also, there are the effects of marine plants and that feed marine animals like fish and shellfish, etc. A huge worldwide protein source, obviously, which could lead to, they suggest, like a 7% loss in seafood. Of course, not everyone accepts these results outright or these exact figures. There are some doubts from uh, some scientists in terms of the quality quality of some of the original data used. I mean, there was a lot of data there, but some of it is, uh, they, they suggest is maybe not the best. Um, no one is doubting the presence of microplastics in food per se, just debating how wide scale or what the effects of those microplastics will be. 
What is pretty well accepted among scientists, though, is that this stuff is absolutely everywhere, and we are just now starting to observe the effects of, well, our plastic use on ourselves, but also on our plants. For so long, plastic has been one of those things that we just assumed we, you know, we could throw out or recycle, which is basically the same thing as throwing it out, as most pl plastics do not really get recycled. And we knew it wasn't great for the environment uh, wherever it went, but it wasn't ultimately going to come back to hurt us directly. That may not be the case. Basically, every piece of plastic that we kind of use uh, recklessly, I guess, uh, we are in some ways just sending it out into the environment to later just become part of ourselves, our kids, our grandkids, our food, each other. Uh, yeah. So farming has a lot of plastic use and it's something that weighs heavily on me, but especially when I see research like this. Is the research perfect? No. But again, no one is debating that plastic is found in places that it doesn't belong or that it can affect a plant's ability to convert water, sunlight, carbon dioxide, nutrients into glucose. That's photosynthesis. We're all just trying to get a grasp on what it means for the future. It's pretty safe to assume it means something that is probably ain't good. Thoughts on microplastics and what it means that they are changing the efficacy of our plants? For now, let's carry on with some more lighthearted material in the next segment as we discuss the effects of agrochemicals in our alcoholic beverages. BRB. Today's episode of Growers Daily is brought to you by Farmhand. Newsletters, right? A necessary evil for CSA farmers. Join Farmhand and Real CSA Farmers on April 11th for a free digital workshop where they'll share strategies they use to turn their newsletters into powerful sales tools. Get the secrets and go-to templates for success when you register for the free workshop today at farmhand.partners slash newsletter. That's farmhand.partners slash newsletter. And I'll put the link in the show notes. All right, back to the show. If you, the listener, are enjoying this content, getting even a small amount of value from it, consider supporting our work over at patreon.com slash no-till growers. I will try to get to questions from everywhere that questions come in, but I will always get to your Patreon questions. Now, today's Patreon question comes from Patreon member Alicia P. Boyajan. Boyajan? I got that right, right, Alicia? Probably. Nailed it. Who writes, quote, Hey, Jesse, love the daily shows. At least once a week, I learned something incredibly valuable. Interested in the segments and comments around the new Surgeon General's warning about alcohol and cancer risk. I strongly suspect this correlation is linked to agrochemicals, grapes, grains, hops, all crops very susceptible to disease and pest pressure and heavily sprayed in conventional systems. Would the cancer link be as strong if someone consumed only beer and wine and alcohol made strictly from crops produced without chemical inputs? I'm just saying. In the wine community around here, there has historically been this idea slash sentiment that organic wine is cheap and low quality. The tide is shifting and it is getting easier to identify producers using organically grown grapes to make high-end wine. There is a wine store in Cambridge, uh, Massachusetts that only sells organically grown and or regeneratively farmed wine. Michelob now even offers a USDA certified light beer, which I buy to put in my weekly pot of chili as I don't want to feed my family small doses of Roundup on a regular basis. I can also now easily find certified organic vodka to preserve medicinal herbs and tinctures. Not saying alcohol is healthy, just uh, wondering what the whole story really is. End quote. Uh, all right. So interesting and fun topic here. Great questions. Uh, thank you, Alicia. So to start, I found a group of questions that I had accidentally skipped over from February. So if some of these topics this week feel a little old, that's on me. My bad. And this is one of the those inadvertently skipped questions. This is why we're talking about that old Surgeon General's warning back from earlier this winter and all the reports uh, coming out on al the links between alcohol and cancer, heart disease, etc. So to be sure, I don't know the answer to your query here exactly. Uh, and I always hesitate to get into health and health claims because human health is just really difficult and unreliable to study because people often under or over exaggerate their diets to researchers. They don't stick to the diet plans of the studies and the studies that would work would have to control people's diets and lives for several years and would be unethical among other issues. But here is what I can find that might be helpful. First, uh, studies have shown trace amounts of chemical contaminants such as glyphosate 
in commercial beer and wine. That is real. Notably, one study from a public interest research group found that, quote, although glyphosate is not allowed or used in organic farming, several types of organic products were contaminated, such as Samuel Smith Organic at 3.5 parts per billion, Inkari Estate Organic Wine contaminated 5.2 parts per billion, end quote. It doesn't elaborate on why or how it got there. My assumption would be like water because it's, you know, that you find those things in water, but who knows? Uh, But yeah, this stuff is everywhere. Although researchers are not all in agreement, glyphosate for its part is considered a carcinogen by some and has been linked to multiple myeloma and non-Hodgkin lymphoma. The cancers that have been uh, linked to alcohol include cancer of the mouth, esophagus, pharynx, larynx, uh, breast cancer in women, liver and uh, colorectal cancer. So there is some hypothetical crossover there with non-Hodgkin perhaps, but no proven links that I can tell. And the cancers linked to alcohol are a bit more broad. Alcohol also has its own pathway to potential cancers unrelated to additional carcinogens, such as how ethanol is broken down into acetaldehyde, a toxin that reportedly damages DNA. So from my vantage, reading through uh, the literature that I can find, neither of those things is particularly great for you to consume, certainly not in large quantities, but who knows? The two combined may lead to new and different cancer risks. Uh, So perhaps organic alcohols may compound the risk less, but that doesn't necessarily mean that alcohol is free of any risks. If you're cooking the alcohol out in your chili, which sounds delicious, I, I that seems pretty low stakes to me. For me, it's also worth saying, I, I guess in a sort of full disclosure kind of way, that I stopped drinking over eight months ago, uh, but I also don't care if people drink, and I definitely don't think you should avoid making tinctures for the potential trace amounts of chemicals uh, or carcinogenic properties, and certainly not, like I mentioned, your chili. Everything is a little good and a little bad for us, or put another way, everything in moderation, including moderation itself, right? So that's not exactly an answer, but I appreciate that it gave me an excuse to look at some of these uh, studies. One thing I always want people to remember about human health is that in terms of health claims of foods and drinks, positive and or negative, human health is just incredibly hard to study. And the studies that often do exist are often flawed or rely on results in mouse or rat studies, which do not always or arguably even often translate to human health. The only reason we are seeing these links in alcohol to cancers is the thousands and thousands of studies from decades of research that we have now that can be examined. uh, And even some of that research is being looked at with some incredulity. Most still believe there's a link, but may differ on the extent. Uh, So because there are so many misleading health claims out there, my general health advice to everyone when it comes to this stuff is to eat the best quality food that you can afford, preferably from your own garden and or farmers you trust and enjoy it. Food should be fun and it should be, you know, fun to eat, fun to share and not stressful. If you have a little wine or beer or cocktail with it, uh, don't sweat the trace amount of chemicals, rather just savor the company. Work towards illuminating the power of ecological agriculture in your friend groups. That will help. But also, don't stress more than you already have to, especially not about food. Stress, for its part, has its own negative links to human health. No need to link the two together. Anyway, thanks for that fun topic here, Alicia, and for your patience. Sorry, I forgot all those questions. Let me know your thoughts on cancer and alcohol and any of the things. Otherwise, we're going to take a quick break. And when we return, why don't we just uh, turn plastic into bricks? Be right back. Today's episode is brought to you by Rimmel Greenhouses. Whether it's tomatoes to market, flowers in the spring, or your family's harvest, growing in a greenhouse protected from the weather provides the right environment that you need for a harvest that you can count on. Rimmel Greenhouses are designed for durability and offer the quality that you need to grow productively year-round. Visit RimmelGreenhouses.com to get a quote today. If I may editorialize for a second, I own a Rimmel tunnel. I love it. We built it ourselves, and I really appreciated the quality of the tunnel as well as the customer service we received in the process. So make sure to check them out. All right. I think everyone has that story of something they thought they invented, and it turns out many other people had already had the same idea. The first time that happened to me was when I was like 10, and I invented in my head, not in real life, Uh, high heels with removable heels for my mom for her job interviews because she said her feet hurt and I thought it would uh, help her go through the day of interviews not having to wear the heels the whole time. It turns out this idea is just about as old as the high heel itself. The next time, so I I wasn't exactly ahead ahead of the pack there, but you know, that's how inventions go sometimes. The next time that I can remember this happening to me was more recently when I, again, in my head and not in any sort of actual way, invented a machine that basically smashed plastic together in a sort of trash compactor and turned it into bricks that could be used for building. 
in my envisioning of this, it would either be a machine that everyone has at home, like, a, I don't know, similar to like a trash compactor, uh, but this specifically made, you know, bricks, or that waste management would come pick up the trash from the week, separate the plastics from the organics, uh, compost the organics, and pack the plastics into bricks that they could then sell as building materials, not as an excuse to use more plastics, but rather as a way to clean up uh, you know, the kind of mess that we have, uh, kind of like a preemptive version of that movie, Wally. It's a great, great movie. Anyway, I was, of course, not even kind of the first person to think of this. Uh, people have naturally been hard at work on this for a while. Poking around online, I found a woman in Kenya who had been making bricks from plastic waste into bricks for paving roads. And I'll link the video to all of these in the show notes. It's really impressive. Uh, there was another group in the Ivory Coast using lower quality, less desirable plastics for these kinds of bricks. I saw on a channel called Brothers Make a video about a company who was producing bricks, but now has pivoted to making uh, things like furniture and fencing and landscaping and stuff. I guess this this company and others had issues with the amount of sorting required, uh, the fact that plastic is exceedingly flammable, so so not always great for building, and the idea that it requires a lot of plastic and infrastructure and potentially power to produce a small amount of building materials. The fumes created in the melting process are, are arguably not great for workers either, but uh, the technology, especially the lo-fi designs in Africa, is really impressive and has potential for disaster relief, uh, you know, putting up buildings really quick, among other applications. Obviously, though, as cool as these systems are, we still just need to use less plastic, myself included. There's not going to be a perfect sort of guilt-free solution to manage the plastic that we use, and there definitely doesn't need to be an excuse to keep using plastic in the way that recycling has become where we feel okay using plastic because heck, we'll just recycle it. Like I said in the first segment though, uh, plastic does not end up getting recycled for the most part. Estimates that are around five to 6% of plastic that goes into the recycling actually gets recycled depending on your location, uh, according to the MIT technology review. So it would be cool to see something like the bricks at least temporarily address that problem and turn that waste, that future pollutant into uh, something useful. Ultimately, however, it's the chemicals used to grow much of our food or the plastic used to insert basically anything that we do in practically every industry. It is not just a problem of those around it or those that use it. It's eventually everyone's problem. And it's not just a solution of shipping it off to be treated or made into something else. Even if we started making bricks from our waste, they will eventually become a problem for our planet too. It buys us some time, certainly, maybe builds us some things, uh, protects some people in times of disaster like we're going through now, but eventually it will return to the soil. Pollutants are everyone's problem and no one person doing things the right way can solve them. It's that bad drift that I've talked about. We try to be as healthy as we want or farm as healthy as we want, but as long as we live in a world that allows for the amount of pollution that we do, it cannot be contained. Good farming practices, good lifestyle practices, that spreads out, but so do bad practices. Negative things do not stay where they are used. Pesticides, herbicides, plastics in the landfill, all of it. So it's our job to develop ecological approaches to growing food using less plastic, which again, I am guilty of myself, but always working to get better by not using chemicals and by appreciating the dangers of single use plastics so they don't end up in our plants and breast milks and livers and toothpastes. The end. Just kidding. I still have to close out, but I think I will wrap it up there for now and await what you all have to say about these things. Don't forget, we are now officially a 501c3, so donations are tax deductible and greatly appreciated. Please make sure to like like and subscribe and or follow wherever you are getting this podcast. That's an easy way to help us out. Enormous thank you to all of our show sponsors. Huge shouts to Willie Breeden for the theme music, Mike Hilbert for the production help and editing, and the team at No-Till Growers. Also shouts to Epidemic Sound for the background music that you can hear. Pick up a copy of the Living Soil Handbook or the Seed Farmer at notillgrowers.com to support our work. Big, big thank you to everyone over at patreon.com slash notillgrowers where at a certain level, or if you just bump up from one level to another, or you sign up in the month of April, you get a shout out on the show. So big shout outs today to Austin at the Ray Farm, Gabriel Smith, Gab Gabriel Smith, one of those two, Estevan Felix. Oh, that's fun. Estevan Felix, Farm Grammy, Farm Grammy, and KDL. Uh, so, all right. So this is uh, a musical from a young street gang in Washington, who get into a little trouble uh, and you know have to go to, to to court, but the judge gives them a mandate to go. I guess that's what you call it in judge terms to go work on a farm uh, where they just assume they'll be doing you know basic manual labor and they'll be out in the sun all day. It'll be like you know 
get, you know, uh, get your life together, all those sorts of things. But what they find out when they get to this particular farm is this particular farm is no ordinary farm. It raises a top secret kind of potato that stores power. Power for what? Well, that is where our story begins. Thanks for listening and or watching. We will see you tomorrow for Tuesday.